commercial. We have only 15 copies left of the Rekos book, so go get one before they're all sold out. James and I can't afford to fly home until they're all yes. sold. <laughs> Save Nick. Save Nick. I have a <laughs> So, yeah, enjoy! <laughs> You really are. You really are leaving us to just. Yes. Yeah. Come on, Martin. Bye. Sure, Martin. <laughs> Hello, welcome. Thanks for thanks for coming. And look, you can see a comic artist work live because he is late. Because he is a comic artist. Well, it just feeds itself, then, doesn't it? So I think we've been. I think you've been promised to talk about mainly about the records, which makes sense. It does. Mm -hmm. Hands up here who has read records in any language. Okay, it's not too bad, yeah, good. good. Correct. Okay. Correct. 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 <laughs> Position to take. That's weird, if I, if I ask them, you'll find that more of them have read Sins of the Records than read Last Stand. That's a weird thing to start with the sequel, isn't it? Should we? Who's no, let's not do that, let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I reckon what we'll do is we will, we will talk about how we, how we came to work together, and a, a bit about the, the Records, um, and then we'll probably do some questions um, and I wonder, I wonder is it best to say up front though, first of all, a huge thanks to Johan and to Andreas uh, and Ades Media for pulling together the Swedish language, which is now officially the definitive version of Last Land of the Records because of the amazing job that they did with it. The production standards are incredible. It's oversized like the way a comic should be so that an egotist artist like myself can finally go, see? Um, it's got like stuff that none of the other languages have. It's got like the cop spotlight and the everything in its right place short story. It's got everything that you need. It's, it can be the first, it can be the last Transformer story you ever run. And it, it's, it's because of the job that they've done. So a big thank you to, to Retcon and, and to Andreas and everything. Uh, it's right, okay. Well, I'll, I'll fill some time while you, while you draw. Um, so Nick and I have known each other since uh, since the 90s. We were both um, obviously we were fans, Transformers fans. Um, we, we lived far apart. Nick in Ireland, and I was down in the, in the Channel Islands, um, nearer France than, than England. Yeah, imagine us living separately. I'm to the 90s. I listen to Blur, and James has listened to Oasis a lot. Of Oasis, it's a big Oasis fan. Yeah, yeah, and uh, <laughs> and back back then when Transformers, um, when, when the UK comic, that was what I think that's what made us both. Um, we're only here really because of that comic. Literally, um, like, I'm only interested in comics almost because of that comic in, in, in lots of ways, I think. Yeah, and as I said on the, the other panel, you know, the, the, the cartoon made, made a bit of a ripple, toys did, but it was really the comic that, um, and therefore the stories which brought everybody together. So when that finished, um, or when, when, when it was about to finish, uh, a group of us, um, pre-internet, so, you know, pen, pay, uh, pay, PayPal? Pen pal type thing, we got together um, to carry on telling the stories. And Nick, you weren't in that first batch, were you? Because you were like six. I, yeah, well, I always wait to know if something is, is cool before I really sort of like. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I'm not able to bring enough of my own cool with something, with me to make it work. But once I've seen like a proof of a proof of, of a function, then I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I, I want part of this. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of joined in in the 90s when like the the the, uh, the Fleet Wave Generation 2 comic folded, and there was a shout out in the back for people who wanted to join in. But I I hadn't realised that there had been this pen and paper community uh, at that time. Um, yeah, so yeah, you guys are all getting it. Yeah, so um, so in the, in the in that Transformers sort of club. Um, we, we told stories together, we did fanzines and fan fiction and art. Um, and as Nick says, it was when Generation 2 stopped and they ran an advert for this, uh, this organisation. And Nick and many, hundreds actually, hundreds of others um, joined. And we somehow had the, collectively had the discipline to put out regular comics and to, to work, as I said, say, work together to tell stories. Now Nick and I didn't work together. We always managed to avoid each other. It was weird. Uh, yeah. Kind of, a, we were fans of each other, and yeah. and we both sort of said separately and to each other as well. But we recognised sort of like everyone was, the standard was really high in that club, and the art was really good. But you you sort of said when I came along, you were like, oh, this guy looks like 
people, and I remember just reading your stuff, and I was like, this guy knows how to use commas, and um, he dots his lines and everything. Still do. And no, yeah, you never, you never, you never let that go, did you? It was, it was always, it was always there, wasn't it? Yeah, I always fall back on a comma. Look, there's lots of commas, lots of commas. Uh, and and these now he'll use them, using the lips, like oh, the ellipsis, I use capitals, I use a whole range of words. All the words. Uh, but so yeah, there was, we were we were sort of fans of each other, and we we had eventually there was a, a convention in. Uh, 2001, Transforce 2001, where there was uh, a kind of a, a very much coming together. Where I, I guess printing cost was even part of it for uh, for for both our cases. That, that there was a, a convention fanzine, and it was a quite high standard convention fanzine. And it was myself and lots of the other TM UK artists, and Jack Lawrence, who's the current artist on Lost Light, and yourself. We all contributed stories. So we were we were we were working on magazines together, but not necessarily on the same story or the same pieces. I think I did a pin up for. Something other that you worked on, and 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 then the same year you were able to do your print, the print run on Eugenesis. So it was a uh, yes, um, yeah. Te te technology, I think, is, is, is part of the story as well, isn't it? I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so and you, you saw Eugenesis before. I mean, that was the culmination of my fan fiction sort of career. And after that, I didn't really plan to do any more Transformers things. Um, Nick. Um, Got into, got broke into the industry. I mean, it didn't just happen like that. There's, there's a story behind that, but in, in a Transformers context. Um, yeah, I mean, for, I mean, I, I think you and I both need to learn how to tell stories quicker. So if you can, <laughs> to, like, to like on paper and in real life, but yeah, yeah. I managed, when when IDW got the license, I was lucky enough to get in and uh, form a relationship with the other there to sort of, that he realised that not only is this guy adequate at drawing things, he he may be tolerable at writing things as well, and that's kind of how. I kind of gained a foothold with IDW that I was able to kind of sort of leave the back door open for you, as it were, uh, and, and, and kind of got us all in. But, but it felt for a while that Transformers wasn't going to be a wasn't going to be a career option at all. Like, I think even that year, in 2001, Dreamwave was maybe just announced, or I don't yeah. think issue one. Had, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't. Think, I didn't feel like it was up and running at that stage anyway. No. So it was still like. Not dead, but it was it was a yeah. It wasn't a feasible career option for any of us, like really. And also, especially from a writer's point of view, you don't need a transformer. Simon Furman writes transformers, so that's you know. he rules the land with an iron fist. He allows no one else to have any taste of what it's like. Yeah, you don't you don't break into com one does not break into comics. They break into Simon <laughs> Furman's career. <laughs> That, that's our story, isn't it? Yeah, 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 just yeah, Furman, taking right. jobs from Simon Furman and Jeff Senior, and then <laughs> throwing them bones in the end, <laughs> in the final moments. But that's how we got in, and then I, I did some work for IW and uh, got uh, some good feedback from that. And they uh, subsequently um, asked me to write a miniseries uh, about the Wreckers, which was very much a fan. It was for the fans. You know, I mean, no one was clamouring for these sort of scene D and D list characters. And uh, needed the help, needed a, a, a big old helping hand on it. So that's kind of where I was able to legitimately say, "This is the writer to come along and help us, help us do it." But records was kind of brought to me. I was I was told I was doing a records uh, series. Uh, Denton Tipton, the editor at the time, brought me for lunch at the Botcon. I think it's the only time anyone like W has paid for lunch. But the, the, uh, so we're going to want to re re relaunch Transformers. We're going to relaunch on three fronts. We've got like an ongoing. We're going to have a Bumblebee, this is post first movie, so Bumblebee is very much now, he's the mascot of, of, of Transformers. Bumblebee's going to get some series, but that's all looking forward and a new kind of uh, direction we've had years for the last kind of four years, I guess, three or four years. Uh, and to keep them happy, the old school guys, the people of your age, like 30 and above, um, we're going to do a series of records. Those, you know, remember the records? And I was like, yeah, I like the records, I want to do records. I was like, Who, who's going to write it? And Denton was like, you're going to write it, you, you can write this. I'm like, okay. Cause, because I've, I've got this friend, James Roberts, he could write it. In my head, I just didn't have the confidence to like write my own series, or I didn't think... I kind of thought there'd been some mistake there, but anyway. And I was also really, really keen, like, uh, when James had published the Eugenesis novel, uh, it really felt like it was the first time that I read a Transformers story that Simon Furman hadn't written that I'd gone, this this is what it should be like. This is this feels like Transformers. It's in a completely impression. There's Transformers off the hook. There's no Hasbro looking over James's shoulder. But the characters still felt like the characters. They were... Simon's characters and Bob and Yancey's characters were taken in a direction it, it just pulled it to their most extreme lengths uh, and I just thought James I just felt that James should be there I never wanted it was never my dream to write Transformers it was my dream to draw Transformers so I'd already gotten that dream ticked off the list uh, 
I, I just kind of felt like it would be nice for Tim and James to come on board. So I, that's ultimately when I kind of felt behind schedule due to butting heads with editors over the direction they wanted to take with various characters, specifically Overlord, and there was lots to learn there that we um, really wanted to fine-tune Overlord's motives to Andy Schmidt, the editor, was really like, no, 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 but I need more of his backstory. No, I really need to know why he wants to do this. No, it doesn't make sense why he feels this way. And it was just eating into the lead time. It was a series that was supposed to be writing and drawing, and it's a team book. Like, anyone who draws, like, superhero team books, like X-Men or The Avengers, they often say, it's really hard to draw that to a monthly schedule, but if you do that, and that team, superhero team happens to be Transformers, and they're attacking a prison full of, like, you know, five times the number of them. It was, it was already going to be a tough ask, and we were running out of time, and it was, it was getting dark. So, literally. And, uh, yeah, and so, we had to, um, I had to call in, call in the professional, and that's... That's how, we, how you were able to come aboard and yeah, really fix, fix the yeah. timeline. Yeah, it, it is hard to break into the industry if you're a writer because it's difficult for editors to ascertain the quality of your work and as quickly as they can um, with, with artists. And so you do often rely on either, well these days, having done your own things, uh, produced your own stuff um, and it's available digitally and it built up ahead of steam gets you know, um, some love and then you can, you've got something to sell uh, or it relies on contacts and people recommending you and, and Nick was clearly highly regarded with it by IBW um, and so his judgment was trusted and they, they took a punt and allowed me to come along and, um, and yeah, we did the rest of records together and uh, yeah and so I mean, Wreckers itself, um, I mean, we gave a similar talk when we were doing the signing yesterday, but we were talking about how um, it's very violent and there's a lot of body horror in there and stuff that you can only really get away with because they're robots. Um, and we, we wanted with Wreckers, we wanted to, um, to tell a, a, both a new type of story, but one which really celebrated the, the essence of the old UK comics, the stuff that we loved about. Um, Simon Furman stuff, we, um, we wanted to celebrate that. I felt like in some ways it was the first, and I mean this is not the case obviously, because Eric had worked on Megatron, Eric has been a fan, and, but it was very much, it felt like a, a fan's, fan's local boys done good, a, a comic made by a, like a, a first generation of fans to come in and like a series, and also, but also reflect the, what, what we loved about it in the first place, so it's, I guess because it was a very firm and sort of centric, I mean the records were like a, a concept that Simon Furman had originated in the Tower 2006 in the UK comics, like they're, he, they were never used in the US comics, they were, they were his guys, so you know, even at that stage it still very much felt like but the, Simon was the only voice that I really could read Transformers in, and even write in, I think you and I both found ourselves, when you write Transformers, you write like Simon Furman, and we often write lines and one of us would say to the other, we're, we're trying to make these sound like Simon stuff, and that, that's really cool because he writes a good book. But like Simon, he's so, like this jokes about Furmanisms and phrases that he tends to overuse, but but the, he, he he would use the phrase face it a lot, and we I find we would often have characters saying face it in Packer, and I was like that sounds really cool. It's like well that sounds really cool because that's what Simon Furman would do. And it's like well we need to kind of and so in that way by sort of like chipping away at each other, maybe we found our own voices somewhat in it. Like, Many yeah, I even remember the the months that we wrote it over those months we did become more confident and yeah. uh, with, with, with the concepts that we used and as you say with the sort of way of talking yeah. um, and I don't know it was I, and also the, the, the gig was about reaching out to a certain type of fan and, and sort of rewarding the long term fans and uh, all that said and, and this is something that came up yesterday we wanted we've always we've always been ambassadors really for Transformers even before we were professionals you know we, we will defend them we'll promote them we want other people to, to see in them what we do uh, and we, we want to sort of whether ourselves or through other people we want the full potential of the brand to be realized um, and what that doesn't mean necessarily because you often see it in with other sort of people that have taken a similar path to us, they, they, they were fans of something and now they're in a position of authority over it and that they can tell their own stories. Um, the temptation is always to sort of go, go dark, you know, because I want other people to respect this and like it in the way that I like it and that means it's got to be adult and it's got to be grown up and, got, and that means serious fighting and blood and what. And, um, and, it, and it is good to explore adult themes but we didn't want that to mean just mindless violence and, and, and horror. Even though Wreckers has got those things, we wanted it to explore 
in fact, we wanted to use that really to explore consequences. And so, um, I saw someone say recently, I was saying to you, that someone described it as having, literally having your cake and eating it. And, but they didn't mean that as, a, as an insult. It was like, it's a story about how war is bad. It's really bad, the effects of war, isn't it? Headshot, headshot, headshot. <laughs> yeah, but it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a visual medium, and especially at that time, there was definitely a, a certain language expected of Transformers comics, and they were, you, you know, the, it was, the emphasis was more on the action, I think. Yeah, it's, it's relentless, isn't it? And it's yeah. visceral. And the nature of the, the, nature of the Wreckers team, is, you know, they, they, they get dropped into these phenomenally dangerous situations. They're sort of like a suicide squad. You expect a body count. That, that's, why, that's why they do what they do, and that's why they have that reputation. But we wanted to, the, the way we were able to explore the effects of being a Wrecker was by bringing in these newbies, and particularly in the character of Iron Fist, um, somebody that is a, you know, within within the universe, you know, in universe, there's this mythologization that's happening about the records. So he romanticizes the records, um, and through the course of the story, of course, through his eyes, as Nick said, he's sort of the audience surrogate. You know, we see what what being a record is really like, and we we de-romanticize it. You know, that the horror of it is uh, is not cool. The, the violence isn't cool. Yeah. Um, but the and the effects of the violence are sort of played out. It's pointed out to him, isn't it, by Topspin and stuff, who like shouts at Mr. The wake up call when things go really badly in Garth's mind that like, like death can be pointless. There's not, you know, that's it's all about the the, the, the lack of romance to, in the hero's death and how it's, it's that's a, a false a falsehood anyway. And, yeah. And so if we're getting into sort of tropes and motifs and, and you know a vaguely meta approach to this, um, we've said more than once that Wreckers was about um, you know in Star Trek when you've got the, the literally the archetypal red shirt that gets killed off early. Well, what if there was a team of red shirts? What if you just followed the adventures of the red shirts? And Iron Fist is, is the ultimate red shirt, but, but the, the other new recruits as well. Um, and so, yes, yeah, systematically, as, they, as they're killed off in a variety of ways, and others react to that, um, it's, about, it's about the untold red shirt story, really. It's weird to talk about, because we realize we're in a room, I think, like, so most people have read it, and here and, and maybe people who haven't read it may I, they might if they haven't read it they might still have some idea of kind of who lives and who dies but it's weird about kind of uh, uh, we after eight years we just, we assume that everyone knows that this character lives this character dies and stuff but I'm, I'm happy to talk about it but it's I do wonder you know so there's, there's we had we had character plans for specific characters to die and they were like Hasbro have always been very good and they're usually quite hands off and, and less. It, it, it's it's like the, it's some very fiddly things that they'll ask for and one of the fiddly things they asked for was like character deaths to be reversed that there's one character who was like from page one like the story was that he was going to die and but it was literally when we were in production of issue four that we were told oh Hasbro don't want that character to die now and it's like but okay <laughs> and, yeah. that, and, and I can say that now in hindsight how, how unusual that is actually yeah it's so, true but, isn't it yeah it's, it's, it's that level of um Intervention, should we say? Yeah, it's not you know not wouldn't normally get that. And then there was other, uh, there was pressure to let other characters survive because they were they were liked by the editorial team. Yeah, as well. Again, which you would not really see. Yeah, so these days. that's true. And so so we were like, okay, we'll let that character die. And then they came up with the suggestion. Of people, well, if you want a character to die, here's a third character. And then we were like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was weird. Like so the the body count would have been higher and. Maybe the, the star power, the, the, the more more famous characters would have died. We we yeah, that's the thing. If you read it, and you find that oh, I just want to let you know we would have had the conviction to uh, to to, yeah. to maybe to maybe kill a few more and more people. Um, expectations were low for records. Um, of the three titles Nick mentioned, it was one that was gonna it was gonna scratch an itch and do okay, but it wasn't gonna set the world on fire. Um, it would it would cater for a particular type of fan, of which there wasn't a huge amount. Um, but you know, of the three, it did, it did best. Um, like, uh, yeah, and it's like it's not even being smug or arrogant about it. But there, there's not, you know, there's no one, there's no one over here doing the Swedish, the Swedish language translation publication of yeah, the Bumblebee series or, or the, the, you know, like we have, we, it's we've seen it from the reaction of the fans, but I think it's more so the reaction we've gotten from people who work in Hasbro yeah. and the people who kind of commission us to do more work in IW that. It, it really left the right kind of effect, I think. Yeah. You know. we, we, didn't, we didn't know what happened after records. No. I mean, the, the, the only reason this is given to you as a, as a, as a point, as an anecdote, is because we're really smug. No, it's because, it's because um, the, 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 the mood music was, it'll be a little thing, yeah. a little print run. Yeah, and, yeah. And, then, and then off you go back to whatever you do. 
Um, but yeah, but it, it caught it caught some sort of imagination, and it, it's um yeah, it's. I think part of that as well is because the characters. I guess that they thought, well, if no one's going to really be into this because the characters aren't all that completely well known. I think the reason why it caught attention is because the characters weren't that well known, which meant we had. You, you could bring them on little bigger journeys, you could stretch, yeah. you know, you could do more with them. Like, you, Optimus, if Optimus Prime and Megatron are front and centre in, in a series, you know, they're, they're pretty much going to come out on stage, like emotionally and physically. But with Wreckers, you know, we, we, we set out from the start that, like, there's, there's, there are consequences in the story, there are, there's a body count in the story. And I suppose, and, and, and there are ramifications to the horrors that these characters are living through. So I guess you realise that you were able to do a story about Transformers that, in that way that hadn't been done before, where there are, are clearly long-lasting physical and emotional effects. I think maybe that's one of the reasons why people latched onto it. You know, it wasn't until just now when you were when you were saying that it made me think how prior to Wreckers, um, I mean, so the, the IDW, the way IDW operated, really, you had all the G1 characters. Um, and yes, some were more familiar than others. And Simon actually, in his IEW phase, he would he'd have a real mixture of characters. But um, um, there was, it wasn't really until records that we took, as you said, real C or D list characters. Yeah. So these were European only toy releases in the main. And and did something with them, which could, which would have been the end of the story. But did something with them, which for whatever reason, people responded to, and the fans took the likes of Iron Fist and, and Rotorstorm to their heart in a way which perhaps gave IDW confidence beyond that to think actually you, know, you can have totally new characters, I mean you have Drift but that's a, that's a different story, but you can have totally new characters which people might well actually fall in love with and, and come and, and adopt and, and want to hit, read stories about. So I mean, yeah, pre records it was really the, the main characters in the books were your generally your yeah, your it's, it's it's, it's characters that that will draw attention, not names. And you, you, the characters based on what they do, not about you know. What they do. And, and even like the characters, they were picked. So a lot of these characters, they, their entire lifespan occurs in records. They don't, you know, they don't make it to the end of the story. And that wasn't because oh, let's find someone disposable, someone we, we don't need. Like, like I selected that cast based on characters or toys that didn't have characters that I thought were really, really cool. I loved Rotorstorm, I loved Pyro, I liked Iron Fist, <laughs> but he's a, and he, you know, he ends up got, coming out with, with most value added to him um, at, at the end of it. But it was because I, I, in the Transformers Wilderness in like 1992, when there was only those European toys, I was starting secondary school and everyone was sort of telling me to sort of like, you know, turn your back on Transformers, put away the childish things, but I really kind of, um, made a connection with those toys and you know and in like my what you call head cannon now but in my in my imaginary games in my, my playtime like those like Broder Storm was like you know the, the, the new badass like Pop Pyro was the new Optimus Prime and, and uh, in some ways it was nice to sort of add some value to those characters even if some of those don't make it out to the end of the story they've had added value by how they act and how they uh, dealt with the siege on Garrus 9. It's a tricky one. It's a tricky one to talk about because we've been we've talked about it for so long in some ways, and it's well, we we recognise that we're also talking to people for the first time about records. That it's, like, it's like, I, I I don't know kind of what needs to be covered and, and what. Yeah, you know, it's, I'm I'm thinking the same thing. I'm just I was going to say structurally, it's quite an unusual story. I mean, we it takes until it's they don't land in Garrus Nine until um, the end of issue two. Yeah, well, no, that's not even that really. Is it? it's, 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 it's the last page of issue yeah, two, right. pretty much. Like they land, and then issue three is kind of like. So if you were pitching a story saying badass Autobots go and uh, do a prison break, the prison break doesn't start until halfway through the story. Yeah. It's, and there's a, there's a, like a really weird editorial reason for that. Do you remember that? That at the time of the continuity, the Andy oh, Schmidt, God, the time the, it took to travel there. The editor had it like there's a mandate that space bridges and um, and just like space fantasy levels of space travel was not workable. That you can't just get to some place like that. And they can't just like use warp gates and things to kind of travel across the universe. That somehow the space bridge network was down. So we would have had them landing in Garrus Nine early in issue two or halfway through issue two. And he was like, "No, you can't do that. It has to be, you know, let's, let's be realistic about this, guys." Um, and subsequently, a, a different editor, John Barber, he, he takes the mandate, uh, the idea of, of uh, which is how you know, how does he put it? He says, again? It, it says um, 
the time it takes to get from A to B is exactly as long as you need it to for the plot. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, that's why people are alive in the nick of time, you know. Yeah. And the, the, that very much is the rule of Sins of the Records that he was the editor of, that people are kind of arriving at planets at the same time, which is, should make sense, but I'm, I'm not going to draw your attention to it. But it's, but it's important for the plot that these characters arrive at the same time as that. So we have to sort of like find a way, this taut sort of prison break drama, uh, find a way to get them there, but also get them there what, what a realistic level of light speed travel would be. And yeah. so we I have, mean, obviously since a lot of research has been done into that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and by Andy as well. Andy. I think he's a, he, he, he used his IDW retirement money to, to, to fund faster than light travel uh, research. But, but it meant it gave us that second issue. And as is often the case, um, inadvertently, you know, that, that rule, um, it, it, made, it meant that we had an issue to explore the personalities of the new recruits, really, which, which added to your investment in them. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you take a step back, it's not till issue three that really the, the fighting doesn't let up after that. It's pretty relentless. Yeah. Um, but then, given that you know issue five, you've got to wrap everything up. It's really only those two issues, three and four, where um, everything's in full, full flow before you move into the final act. Yeah, but I, I remember like thinking, you just you try to keep everyone's attention and. There hadn't been many comics done about robots just talking. I don't mean that in a derisory way, but it's a uh, you know that you, you, you get to earn that by doing like sort of like issues and issues of work on something like more from the CI where you can have a top issue. We didn't earn that. We need to have action in the first issue. We need to have action in the second issue. And so you end up relying on flashbacks. So you see the, the sacking of Garrus Nine at the beginning, and you meet Overlord straight away. And you see that kind of prison battle. And then throughout, you sort of see the time passing on Garrus Nine, the three years that he's been there. So that was an excuse to find a way to go. Look, here's some punching, here's some transforming, here's some uh, decapitations. And similarly, in issue two, there was like flashbacks where people are telling the legend of Overlord, and so you get to see him in action. But literally, just because at that stage in our career and in maybe IDW's kind of line of Transformer storytelling, you couldn't just risk five stories of very interesting and well written chat between these new characters. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so uh, um, so yeah, it's, it's important to kind of keep keep their uh, like visual reasons to kind of keep reading and keep, keep some action kind of going to punctuate the sort of the meet these new characters. And I guess it was also the first time um, in IDW, and maybe the first time. There are some exceptions I'm thinking, but generally the first time that there was a degree of self-awareness. You know, we we had we riffed on a few on a few in-universe things, like there's a conversation in issue two when they're talking about essentially their mottos, you know. So Stoppage exists outside of the of the story, in toys or whatever, but you know, there, there was that, we, we, we had fun with that, we, there's the joke about combining, I mean, it wasn't getting too Deadpool, but there was still, there was still this sort of, well let's have fun with it, let's, let's, let's draw attention to the, the weird and, and fun elements of, of the Transformers as a, as a concept. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It's a lot better for fans and it's about fans, and, and it's uh, yeah. I mean, like any kind of this, that was like sort of a numerical code required. It would we'd often have it sort of referred to like the some UK issue titles. And, yeah. Nick, why is Verity in it? Why is Verity in it? Uh, question uh, because as the artist, I I always I always want to draw Transformers, but once I became a comic book artist, I also realised there's probably more than this I want to draw. And more than that, like there's no other publishers doing comics with giant transforming robots. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to need to draw, want to draw a human. I'm going to be drawing this for like six months or seven months, however long it takes to draw. <coughs> so, and the razor shaving just went straight down my lung. Um, um, but I, I want to be able to draw something that isn't a giant robot. And so having someone who's like uh, just a different shape than they are was, was essential. And also just to have like a female voice in it. And not, not necessarily in a sort of a, like a white on or, or like a kind of diversity with a capital D, but it just did feel even at that stage that we, we, we you know, it's, it's a bit boysy and uh, we could, I'm not, I, you know, we could do with a different voice. We could also, it was also the fact that I was a big fan of like Simon's stuff and I wanted to see kind of where her story went, you know. Um, so I kind of, that's why I brought her in. And I remember a lot of people sort of thinking that she she was inessential to it, and she's just there to be kind of wise crappy. But I have a I also have the thing with Transformers comics. It's a personal thing. It's like that in general. So like Lost Lake exists and Morning Star exists, uh, but I, I always think that there should be another comic, and there is now where Transformers are in context that there is a human, that there is someone smaller than, weaker than, them, not made of giant robot who is indestructible and immortal. 
because otherwise they're not, you know, they're not giant robots. And that's what we started saying, you know, a couple of my tracks here. Last Light exists because Autobots Prime exists or the Transformers exists, you know, it's kind of, but it's, I don't know, there still needs to be that element of otherness of Transformers and stuff. And a lot of times for me, that's it's used. Bit, yeah, it's a bit like the Doctor Who thing with, you know, you need a companion yeah, to see it yeah, through their eyes. Yeah, I mean, I wish I just said it like that because it would have been cut straight away, but, but it's true, that's exactly it, you know. Uh, um, uh, there was actually a, a, a abandoned subplot where she was going to be on a revenge kick. They were going to find, uh, set after Maximum Dinobots, where her friend Hunter had been uh, uh, turned into Sunstreaker's headmaster by the Machination. Um, and Scorponok is um, apprehended at the end of Maximum Dinobots and he's taken to the prison plant, Garrus 9. Uh, but so is his head, who is a human called uh, Abraham Dante. Or Dante Abraham, Abraham Dante. And he was responsible, he's part of the reason why Hunter was turned into this kind of like half robot, half monster. Uh, Hunter had since died, that's right. All her Megatron had been and gone, Hunter had died. And Verity was on a revenge kick. And so when she finds out that the guy who was responsible for Hunter's condition, uh, Hunter's ultimate fate was there, she was going to uh, kill him. And there, it was going to be an instance where Pyro was going to use his sort of like Optimus Prime levels of kind of empathy or his belief levels of empathy to convince her to be human. That, that it was sort of like she was going to have disregard for life that you know that you would normally associate with Transformers and she was going to be taught the value of life almost that she kind of crossed it, going to cross a line. So that was one, also one of the reasons, that was a story that I wanted to tell early on with her. That just, there's just no room for it. Like you know, it wasn't even one of the things that got cut because it didn't work. It was just. It, it, it didn't work because there was no room, you know, there's the other stories, the other character stories just necessitate, necessitated that, that that story get, get wiped. And it's for the better, it was a more streamlined story, I think that's, that's the nice thing about Last Stand, it's, it kind of goes in kind of one direction, I think, in, in, in a good way, you know, it's kind of, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's got like a momentum in, in that sense, not that it's linear or on rails, but it's a, uh, it's got... Iron Fist flashbacks. Yeah, exactly. I think stuff. every every issue of Park Mission Five has a flashback as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, until you realise, I guess, that the whole story is being flashback because you get to present day, the last panel, yeah. and then you know, so it's, you know, if you squint, there's a flashback and everything. So, so that's that's, yeah. why, that's why Verity was in it, and that she was because she, she plays a big part in the story. But then ultimately, in the subsequent record stories and since the records and recreating the records available now from older comic shops, it, you know, like she, her story becomes central, central and. I, I, I kind of I like that, I kind of like that she, she gets to play a part. Just as a, as a fan of Simon's character and Simon's writing, it's kind of bad that she sort of lasted as long as she did. And it's down to us that she did, I guess, that we added. Again, we added value to her when I think she probably would have been forgotten about. Yeah, I think, I think for, for, for various reasons, um, none of them good. Um, so Simon Furman's stuff, IW stuff, was sort of, that was been that had been sidelined. It was a new approach to things, and, and, and All Hail Megatron really was intended originally as a, like a debt clearing exercise. Um, but we started to with very few. Hang on a second. Yeah, yes. yeah, we, yeah, we brought that back. Anyway, should we should we put I'm sorry, yeah. some questions and, and hope there is some questions? Well, I've got them. I'll bring the mic to you. Anyone got any questions? Any record questions? No last night questions. No more than ECI questions. Just record questions. In fact, yeah. let's go that way. Like, any questions about anything? Yeah, actually, we'll take anything there. Yeah. Yeah. No questions is, is, is a damning judgment about this, about the quality of our conversation yeah. so far. Yeah, I'm trying think. to think. Is there anything else that we... Because of what, what, what haven't we revealed, I guess? I mean, that, there's something... As with anything, there's always stories of, like, just drafts containing entire, like, arcs that just didn't make it, and... Uh... I'm trying to think of a record fact we've never disclosed. I can't think, because we've been looking at it for eight years, have we, in various languages, <laughs> in various formats. I can't really think of anything, really. It was, uh, I mean, we, we talked a lot about how we, were, we live, you know, we live, James lives in Guernsey and I live in Dublin, and it was all written, like, remotely, like, it was phone calls occasionally and Skype calls, but it was all sort of, like, sending scripts back and forward to each other. Uh, and even how that worked, there was kind of, like, the, the, like, the bones of the first half. This, the work would have been done by me when James kind of came aboard, he was kind of, like, Retroactively writing, and he was like, it's like Wallace and Gromit, where you're laying the tracks down ahead of you super fast before the artwork can kind of reach it. And that was kind of like, you know, where James's strength was really kind of coming into it. That makes it sound like it was just to do the donkey work, it wasn't. It was to sort of realize this, this you know, dovetail us to this beautiful ending and, and have all these kind of little facets, like with the brain bullets and uh, and then like Overlord's face and how he kind of ultimately go out. But that was, we, so we, but we were never in the same room, we never got to enjoy 
you know, like working on this thing, it was doing quite well. We on on the fans fan forums, it was, it was being received really well. And then James visited, it was the last one, the last issue came out, it was issue five, was that James visited me in Dublin. And um, we got to kind of go through the original artwork together. And there's one scene, there's one scene in the prison that had been scripted as, uh, you sort of see them in general prisoners having a tough time uh, uh, in an earlier issue. And then later on in the story, you find out what happened to him. It's the exact same scene, but like they've just been like, just tortured to death and just like holes drilled in all of them. One of them, one of them has been pulled through the like the very small slap of a cell door, but just like just pulled literally through it. Another one is like sitting there catatonic in his cell, but with his Ottawa badge stuffed into his mouth, like he's just like a suckling pig. I remember like laughing when I was drawing it, just enjoying doing it, and then like the two of us sitting on our sofa, like you know, like just watching us giggling at like you know. It's absurdity. It's absurdity. It's absurdity. It's absurdity. It's absurdity. It was the Fortress Max episode yeah. that we that we really yeah. lost yeah. on us, and it's not like we thought we were writing it for a like, We believe in these characters and the the journey they went on, but there was something about sort of like flipping through these pages together and seeing that scene of Fortress Max, where every limb has been like you know chopped off him, and he's just sort of like wired to bits and. His eyes that held open, and we were just like, "Why do we do this?" It was like, it's like when you make a mess as a kid, and you're sort of like you're just caught up in the moment, and you just destroy everything. And you look at it, you're like, yeah, so "Why do we do this?" What, what, what have we learned about What's ourselves wrong? as a result? Remember, we were sort of we hadn't sort of seen each other in like um, nine years. We had like we'd only met once at, at like Transforce 2001 convention, and but we, we we kind of bonded. And the same with Jack, we all connected really well. And so 2010, we were sort of sitting on my sofa in Dublin looking at it, and I just remember like you know you're your other half coming through the door and just go, have you kissed yet? <laughs> and we were like, not yet, but we were just about to before you came in. By the time she ruined the moment. But um, yeah, yeah, so uh, that, was, that was kind of nice to me, to sort of kind of like, have like an after party, because it's, uh, and it's like this, we were like, yesterday at, at the Comics Alliance in Malmo, we got to sort of like, have like a book launch after like, you know, eight years. You know, it's, it's nice, it's nice to sort of like recognize the moments. Uh, especially because like the IDW continuity is now kind of like drawn to a close, and it's this was, you know I had done some work for IDW before, and there's lots of firsts before this, but it very much feels like a kind of a, a ground zero for like our careers and kind of like our calling cards. And so I'm allowed to say that if you if you read Wreckers but nothing else, then there is a sequel to Sins of the Wreckers, yeah. it's a mini series, and then. Last week was sort of release of the final um, instalment in the trilogy, which is Requiem. Yeah, some characters were still alive by the end of Last Stand, so we used them. And then after that, there's a few characters left at the end of Sins of the Records. So, so if you ever want to that comic where it's just two robots talking to each other, that's, uh, that's what Requiem of the Records is going to be. Requiem, uh, Sins of the Records is interesting because with Overlord in Last Stand, it felt like, you know, how do you kind of top him? He's, he's like your bend of level boss, and then. Uh, kind of, you really have to, the, the villain in uh, Sins of the Records is Tarantulas, and uh, the, the, it's probably spoiled some of that. <laughs> but, but also, it might make you buy it. Uh, and it's, you know, he, he's, he's, he's bad in a different way. He's got an emotional connection to another character in that story, and it's, uh, and then Requiem in the Records, it was very much like, well, how are you top Overlord and top Tarantulas? And, Please buy that to find out because it's. it's a, I think I came up with a good way around it. So, but but uh, last time the records was like, like I I was kind of burnt out from drawing Transformers. I've always wanted to write Transformers. I've never lost the desire to write Transformers. But I kind of was burnt. I think it was the start of me being burnt out from just drawing. Them. And uh, and so I kind of like pulled back for a little while with IDW. But in the meantime, James was able to get some more work writing. Uh, issues of the ongoing. Like it was only when you mentioned earlier on, I knew that the, the chaos theory two part that you wrote was part of the ongoing, but it was only then when you contextualise it like that earlier on, I realised, oh, maybe that's why my cost was a little bit. <laughs> oh well, you know, the, your comic that is yours to write, and we're giving it to someone else for two issues, and those two issues end up being the cornerstone of kind of everything that comes out. But that's what happens when you're brilliant, James. That's what happens when you're when you're amazing. And so that's, you know, and ever since then, like, James has really kind of, like, worked to kind of change the kind of the face of Transformers comics in a good way. Uh, that, like, you know, things that are, like, now possible in Transformers comics just due to, like, some, just kind of, like, emotional kind of believability and, uh, and consequences that, that, that we'll find in character interaction. It's not supposed to be there in Transformers before, so it's kind of... Kind of, that's kind of for further reading after records. And you know, you all, you know all this anyway. You know, we got to travel this bunch, but that's Yeah, I mean, I was gonna, that's why I mentioned the, your other two records series, just in case there are some people that don't, you know, this is yeah, the, I, yeah. records may be the first. So, 
It is. There's two sequels, and then if you want, um, there, there are things in records which um, which feed into the Morgan Meets the Eye ongoing. So that was that was January 2012, um, and that ran for 57 issues, and then it was reborn as Lost Light, which is still going now, and which will conclude in a in an incendiary finale um, in the next few months. So October this year is, is issue 25 of Lost Light, and more or less, if you look at annuals and specials, more or less the 100th issue of More Than Meets the Eye. So it's, it's been a long arc of a story which has its origins and records, so check that out too. I think one, one of the interesting things, and this, this does start to become like us really patting ourselves on the head, but it's like one of the legacy of records is uh, the effect it's had on creators and potential creators. and. You know, there, there seems to be like a lot, a lot of fan reaction, a fan response to it that kind of came out in fan art. Um, it seems to be around that time that the fan base was diversifying anyway. And I think some of that even came from the movies, just opening the Transformers up to a general audience, and even if they didn't necessarily like the films or, or they, they, they were slightly interested by the films, they checked out the comics and found out that, especially with records, there was something a little bit more meaty to get their teeth into. And so you can start kind of, we noticed that at conventions that. Fact, there was fans who had read records who were kind of there because of records and they started reading Transformers yeah. and a lot of them ended up being being female or at least non cis males, you know, and, and that's interesting. And, and as well as that, uh, the, the, the effect it's had in some of the art community, so the artist on Optimus Prime, Kei Zama, she's a Japanese artist who, in her first year of being a professional, worked for IDW and Bar and 2000 AD. A really, really hate her. But, she, but her first, was it her first Western comic, her first Transformers comic anyway, was Last Out of the Records. And she she hadn't read a Transformers comic, and that's how she got into Transformers. That's how she got into drawing Transformers. That's how she got her, her job drawing Transformers, which is just mad. It's just mad. It's, kind of, it's weird to think that in a very short time that we've been working that we're seeing that level of catch up that it took Simon Furman 20 years to see people going. We're here for your job! <laughs> it's already happening to us now. Yeah, they're coming for us now. We really are, yeah. yeah. They, they can have it. Yeah. We're, gonna, we're gonna pick the bones dry and they can, uh, <laughs> they can have what's left. But that's, 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 nice, that's nice to see you here and see. And, um, yeah, yeah it's nice. it, feels, it feels like it did leave a mark that we left on our career, but it seems to have done on, on the landscape of Transformers. And it does seem to be, along with more than BCI, the book that non Transformers fans. We recommend other comics readers yeah, to say that means a lot. That means a lot, you know. And it's kind of and that's us saying that sounds like well, of course you'd say that you've written it, but it's you know I heard someone say it once. I saw I saw it on the internet, so it has to be true. But no, it's nice. You, you get feedback occasionally from people who work in the industry who say, oh yeah, records. You know, records is, is the book that like uh, I don't know Transformers, but I know records. You know, that's that's, that's kind of good. So this is probably the last time we'll talk about records in this in this way. I, I think so. Yeah, I think. <laughs> It's, it's eight years, I mean, it's a fantastic reason to be up here because of this incredible translation. As Nick says, it's the, it's the definitive version, it's the biggest version. Um, but yeah, it's probably, so it's quite, with the IDW continuity coming to an end, and Lost Light coming to an end, and you know, all the new stuff is on the horizon, um, the opportunity to sort of have one last sort of chat about, about what it, yeah, where it all began. So yeah, thanks, thanks for giving us opportunity. Yeah. Are there any questions? Um, or are you just so overfed with information and trivia? <laughs> but there's, yes. Now, since the UK comic never, never came to Finland, the US, US comic did, but only part of it. I'm a little bit, little bit fuzzy about this whole record thing. Who, who came originally even came up with the idea of records and uh, is it some and and uh, in the story information that how how does one become a record anyway i yeah i i, I think we've always followed the rules so i follow the rules that simon kind of set out not that there were rules but he in this the target 2006 story that he wanted to have an interlude on cybertron uh, because there's this like background story going on of like the uh, Cybertronian resistance and the race against time before this uh, do or die uh, mission on Cybertron is going to take place, um, and it, it was a, it was a weird it's a weird issue it's one issue of Target 2060 you could probably miss skip in some ways 
And it's interesting because it's got the toys in it that you could probably skip as well because it's the records were. I guess they were like Simon looked at the characters that weren't being used in the US comic and they weren't that had toys but didn't have any sort of like in universe appearances and then he sort of just threw them together. It's like you know when you sort of like you know just, it's like Thursday night you know paydays until tomorrow you've got some food left in the house but it's uh, is it enough to make a meal with? I guess it tastes like something and that's kind of what the records are I think it's kind of they're they're made up of the the kind of the half forgotten kind of characters. I mean, but in my head, like, like, so Springer wasn't in the original lineup of the records. He kind of gets introduced a couple of issues down the line, and uh, but in my head, Springer's still a new record. <laughs> you know that sort of way because you know, so he, he, and he's too, he's too well known in some ways. I was sort of like, so it's like the kind of the, the like the characters that Simon created for the comic, like Impactor and Rack and Ruin, and and just the characters that like like Roadbuster and World who don't look like Transformers. That, that's yeah. the thing about them. They kind of well, World especially. There's just something kind of untransformery about them. They look like misfits. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's kind of I think that's part of it. And in in universe, how do you become a wrecker? I think I think that there has to be a, like a level of like misfitness about you as well. That there's uh, you know it, it, you've got to be a square peg. But it can't just be that like you don't work well with others. It's like you don't work well with others because you've got a violent streak yeah. <laughs> or you're really good at like killing people and, and like this kind of. This, it uh, is the stuff that, that no one else would do, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not just because it's dangerous, but because it's it's morally. There's moral issues yeah. sometimes. Yeah, you, 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 there's definitely. I'm sure there's definitely stories th to be told where, you know, your characters will be faced with a prison sentence oh, or join the records. You know, they, they would be a Suicide Squad yeah, style. Yeah. You know, like it's like, you know, it's kind of. I okay, can see them being that sort of characters. But as, then, as far as like, but as far as like, you know, curating them or creating them. You always look for characters that are kind of. It's not just characters who have kind of never got used. It's characters who kind of get never, never used for a reason in some yeah. ways, you know. So it's uh, that. That's kind of a good way to kind of pick the records. They should never be, you know, the records should never be the Christmas toys. They should never be the big splashy sort of like, you know, um, sexy ones. Basically, really, you know, like you know. Um, the records are the bootlegs, aren't they? Yeah. The, 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 the beach kiosk. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff you find. Yeah, is this the, the, the ones that your your well-meaning grandparents buy you thinking it's a transformer, but it really is. Really yeah. yeah. But in the universe, they're the ones that are like you know sniffing lighter fuel behind the, behind the school. You know? so, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's yeah. It's a good question though. Yeah, it's, it's weird to sort of contextualize records like that for like how how and what how and why are the records? Why are the oh, records? I don't know. How are they? They're fine. They're all, they're mostly. <laughs> How were the rappers? <laughs> Anything else or uh, I think. Yeah? Good. That might be the last. Yeah, the, the last. The oh last no, we've got one, we've got one. Oh yeah. Please. Please. This question has to put a fantastic bow on the whole record <laughs> side, so there's no pressure, but no pressure at all. it's really please don't let this end on a on an anticlimax. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, did you have any input in the Swedish translation? Last uh, time. The original words are ours. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the question was, did we have any influence in the original translation? Uh, not in the translation. Uh, Johan, who, who uh, put it together for us, for us. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thanks, kid. Uh, he, Johan put it together. He. Um, he, I think he asked me some preferences about it. like we were trying to sort of figure out the formatting of like the the extra stories that appear in the cop issues and, and things like that. And chronologically, it would have been amazing to have started to open the first page and spotlight cop going into everything in its right place, then going into last stand. But I, I do think those stories probably are sort of better as like. Like like that to try this as opposed to you know we're, we're trying to sell these books for God's sake so let's leave you know put the main event up there I think um, Johan took a lot of the racism out but we know I think he took, <laughs> maybe added some more no it was uh, one one good thing that we found that you did or that Andreas was maybe responsible for was that in the foreword we got in trouble for this with Jack Lawrence when he read Last Stand on the Record so Jack Lawrence artist of Lost Light read Last Stand when it came out in hardback but he read the foreword first and in the foreword because we assumed anyone buying this hardback had maybe read it before we sort of lay out in the foreword so when this character dies it's a big emotion and Jack was just like for fuck so I know that it was yeah we took it out that's a clever yeah. idea that's good that's a good editor that is so. <laughs>
I didn't know Jack could read. I mean, the way he draws your scripts, I was like, she's so feared he was flying blind. So it was a. Um, so yeah, so that, that's what. But that was an influence. That was literally sort of a grown up coming along and fixing your mistakes. I don't know if you'd like to talk about the. No, please. Not really, but uh, one of the things, uh, uh, Thomas Hurston, uh read the book before. It, uh, we printed it uh, just to get a, a feel, to get his view on it. Uh, and what you thought of the translation. And I guess that just to say something about me and my growing up in the 80s and being obsessed with the, with the, the comic, but the first thing he did when he had read it, he texted me and said, this is reading like a, a, a Marvel E1 translation, Swedish translation. Wow. Yeah. And I'm not sure that's a positive, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely industry standard and that's something, so it's... It, it is what it is, so... <laughs> No, but yeah, you know, you know, put like blood, sweat, and tears. Like you, you know, he, 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 kept, like you know, he's, he was a member of the creative team in the way that you cared about it, and you know, from the interactions they had, like you know, like it mattered to you, like you know, in the way it mattered to us. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I, 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 it, it was important for me to get this right. Uh, we were at the Grand Canaria with the family, and I woke up at five, start, uh, sat down, translated until eight. And then went to the pool or whatever. Every day we were on on vacation. Uh, that, and that's how yeah. the comic was, was, was made in the first place. I, I I literally turned 30 writing the script that you want while my family were in the pub <laughs> at my 30th birthday. I got home early to sort of kind of get some stuff done. And, uh, I'll have a proper party later, but like we were out for a night out and I was like, Andy Schmidt was looking for some pages, so I had to go home. But I remember just literally like marking it as in my, my, my parents' front living room and just like marking, seeing the clock go to zero, zero, going, oh, I'm 30 now and I'm writing this bloody comic. <laughs> so it's a, but, 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 but a lot of credit has to go to Andreas, yeah. who, who made this deal with, with Hasbro, with IDW. <coughs> yeah. I don't think any of us uh, had any hope. As it would. I wasn't sure. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I hope to it, but, it, but I, I don't know how the, like the, the, how the background, the business side of things are just completely. And we're negotiating with like foreign rights and foreign publishers, especially because it is just easy for them to just go, nah. You know, it's be so easy for the W to go, oh, you're fine. This is a headache. We don't need this. You know, we probably made as much money on this as we're going to make substantially. You know, like we don't. You know. You know, why, what, 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 what does it matter to us to do it for? So, kind of credit to IDW, but credit to you to make it's clearly, you know, you're good at your job if you're able to kind of like make them go, all right, yeah, we'll do this, you know. So, thank you very much. We're very, we're very, very lucky. So never, just never thought it would happen. Never, never, you don't, you don't think, you don't think, you don't think any of the effects are going to happen. There's, like, there's other effects that have happened where we've, we've had people kind of tell us that, like, they've, um, that you know that, that like it's, it's helped them with like the mental health issues and stuff you know by sort of like them characterizing you know issues they're having as as overlord but sort of being able to like look at sort of their fight against it as the wreckers you know and things like that and it, it's you, like you don't write you're not you're, you know you're like you we, we care as, as much as we care and we care a lot yeah. but it's it's weird you know it gets in people's lives and stuff like that and, and then you find yourself you're in a really hot Sweden <laughs> um, uh, you know, sort of still talking about it, and uh, and, and yeah, and we're just really, really grateful. On that note of gratitude, then, yeah, thanks very much for listening to us, and for those who bought a copy, then that's great. There's yeah, still some left, haven't we? Yeah, fifteen left. Fifteen, yeah, oh, last, last fifteen, last fifteen, guys. Yeah. Last fifteen. I'm not carrying them home, my luggage, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, um, so yeah, please, but thank you so much, everyone who supported it, and thank you so much. And, uh, thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you.